Video games have come a long way in the past few decades, and I think there are few specific genres in games that have a more interesting history than horror. Last year I highlighted Sweet Home, a game sometimes credited with creating the building blocks for survival horror as a genre. If you didn't watch that video, because very few people did, here's a very brief summary. <gasps> Sweet Home is a horror RPG developed by Capcom and released for the Famicom in 1989. It is a licensed title based on the Japanese film of the same name and likely for this reason never left Japan. It was directed by Tokuro Fujiwara, who would go on a few years later to direct Resident Evil, which was actually originally pitched as a 3D remake of Sweet Home before getting retooled into a more original concept that would end up revolutionizing horror games as we know them. <sighs> Got all that? Good. Today we're going to talk about a different retro horror game, yet another one that predates titles like Resident Evil, though this one isn't really considered quite as historically significant. Our story takes us to a period a few years after Sweet Home made its debut, jumping from the age of the Famicom to one much more super than that. Human Entertainment was established in May of 1983, and they would go on to develop games for a wide variety of platforms, from arcade cabinets to the NES to the Wonderswan. The name may not ring a bell to many, especially in the West, but according to Wikipedia, they developed over 80 games in the span of around 17 years. Their main boasts were stuff like the Fire Pro Wrestling series, and they're even credited with creating the first dance-based rhythm game, Dance Aerobics for the NES in 1987, almost a full decade before Dance Dance Revolution would smash onto the scene in 1998. Sadly, outside of their expansive list of games, there doesn't seem to be a large amount of information on the company available, as far as I can tell. Two relatively big-name developers found their start at Human. The first, and arguably much bigger name, was Goichi Suda, or as he's better known nowadays, Suda51. But we're not here to talk about Suda51. He's had his own time in the sun, and also he didn't make a horror game I like. We're here to talk about a name you're less likely to have heard, Hifumi Kono. Once again, unfortunately, the internet does not seem to have all that much in the way of information on Kono's early life or career. A lot of articles talking about him appear to be largely lost to time. What we do know is that he is a very big fan of Dario Argento. Argento is an Italian film director who mostly deals in horror, gaining titles like the Master of Thrill in the course of his career. He worked on films like Dawn of the Dead, Tenebrae, and, most importantly for this story, a film called Phenomena. Phenomena is an Italian film directed by Dario Argento and released in 1985, most notably starring Jennifer Connelly and Donald Pleasance. It's a strange movie, to say the least, taking place in the Swiss countryside and focusing on a young girl who can telepathically communicate with insects. There's a lot of murder, I guess. When the film came to America, over 20 minutes apparently had to be cut for ratings reasons, and the film was renamed Creepers, which I think we can all agree is a much weaker title. Even so, Hifumi Kono seemed to take a liking to this film in particular, and when he was put in charge of a small team with a small budget in order to make a more experimental title, it and the rest of Argento's work took center stage in his mind. The resulting project was the 1995 Super Famicom horror title that was unlike anything the industry had yet seen. Clock Tower is a point-and-click adventure game that puts players in control of a young lady named Jennifer Simpson. Jennifer is an orphan living in Norway who one day finds herself adopted by a reclusive man named Simon Barrows, alongside three of her fellow orphans, Laura, Anne, and Lot. When Mary, the woman who escorted the girls to the mansion, takes an unusually long amount of time to fetch the master of the house, Jennifer offers to go find her. Shortly afterwards, all of the lights go out, a scream rings out from where her friends were, and Jennifer returns to find them all missing. This is the first main aspect that separated Clock Tower from other video games at the time. You aren't playing as a hero, you're playing as a person. Jennifer doesn't have any combat abilities, no super jumps, no extreme intellect, no weapons. 
nothing. She's just a normal teenage girl. When she's panicked, she gets clumsy and trips. She takes forever to climb things. She walks at a slow pace, and what would be meaningless obstacles in other games at the time are insurmountable for her. Kono had done this on purpose, even though his fellow devs didn't believe that a game like this would ever work. He wanted to make a game where you were never meant to fight the enemy, you were supposed to run away from them. Another key difference with Clock Tower is atmosphere. Much like Sweet Home Before It and Resident Evil After, Clock Tower chose to place its story in a sprawling and fancy mansion. The power is out, the lights don't work, and every room has something unnerving or surprising to find. The environments of Clock Tower are a big part of why it's so effective in creeping you out, and the sprite work in this game is absolutely phenomenal. But it's only half of the equation in this case. The other half is the game's use of its soundtrack. There's not a lot of music in Clock Tower. Much of the game is played in silence, with only Jennifer's footsteps or the ambient sound of the world cutting through. Akira Yamaoka, the composer most known for his work on the Silent Hill franchise, once said, Selecting moments of silence is another way of producing sound. And Clock Tower is an excellent example of this. For the most part, there's no music. But when there is... It's a clear sign that it is time to go! Koji Nikaro's work on the soundtrack of Clock Tower is some of my favorite music from this era of games, as simple and repetitive as it may be. This also serves as a great segue into our next important factor. What are you running from? Once her friends go missing, Jennifer continues to explore the Barrow's mansion, and depending on where she wanders, she will witness one of her friends be killed in one of three surprisingly graphic ways. And from this moment on, the Scissor Man is now active. I'll admit that from a design standpoint, Scissor Man is a bit goofy. He's a small, zombie-like child wearing short shorts and wielding a massive pair of scissors. Other than the fact that his scissors could cleave you in half no problem, there's not really much there to be threatened by. Also, his real name is Bobby, which is a bit disarming, I suppose, so we'll just set that aside and not worry about it. So why is Scissor Man scary? Well, it's because he's not trying to be threatening, he's having a good time. When he kills you, he doesn't roar or stalk off to find other victims. The dude literally dances over your corpse. He does a little jig. What a jerk. He can also be anywhere from this point on. Every time you enter a room or interact with something, there is always a chance that the scissor man is going to pop out from behind a curtain or crash through a window. And once that happens, you have no option but to run and hide. Again, Jennifer is not a hero. She can't fight. The only way to avoid death by giant scissors is to sprint away and hide in closets or under beds, which even then won't always save you. He is a constant presence throughout the game, a threat that always has a possibility of showing up regardless of what you're in the process of doing, and you have no real way to defend yourself. Jennifer is helpless, and by extension, you are helpless too. Clock Tower is by no means a perfect game. Jennifer's default walk speed is unbearably slow. Some of the puzzles can be a bit too obtuse, and a D-pad will never not be an awkward way to control the cursor of a point-and-click game. But what it does well, it does really well, and it did all of it without any sort of real template to draw lessons from. In a way, Clock Tower reminds me of a different era in horror games, and I'm sorry to go off on a tangent, but hear me out. Horror, more so than any other genre in video games, is a genre that has a bad habit of learning the wrong lessons from its successes. About 90% of horror games nowadays make the same mistakes or step in the same pitfalls because they've taken a lesson from one of their successors that was the wrong one. It happens in cycles, usually whenever something new and unique finds more success than expected. The earliest example of this that I can point to is probably Silent Hill 2. I love Silent Hill 2. It's a deeply personal story about James Sunderland dealing with his personal demons and overcoming them. The villain of Silent Hill 2 isn't the monsters, it's not Pyramid Head, it's not even the town itself. It's James and the myriad of ways his guilt and disgust with himself manifest into a situation he deems to be a fair punishment for the things he's done. James's mental health, his personal baggage, is the main antagonist. This 
never really happened again. Most Silent Hill games went back to focusing on the cult, and when they tried to lean back into the mental health side, it just never succeeded as hard as before. But for the one time it did hit the bullseye, it was amazing. Silent Hill 2 is one of the most influential horror games ever made, for better or for worse. About a third of horror games that come out today want to be Silent Hill 2, but the only lesson they took away from it was that if they wanted their game to be deep and beloved, they had to make it about the struggles of mental health. So many games try to twist the story into, but the true monster was their PTSD, or it turns out they were super depressed and this is all symbolic. That's overall fine, but a lot of these games don't land as well as Silent Hill 2 did. It's such a common trope nowadays that when it happens, I lose a ton of interest, even in games I had been enjoying up to that point. When Silent Hill did that plot, it was fresh, it was uncommon, these were themes big mainstream titles didn't touch on. Though, I guess Silent Hill 2 is gonna be... 20 years old? Next year? Oh god. So maybe a more modern example would work better for the young folks out there. Luckily, I have one, because another third of modern horror games are trying to be something else. Five Nights at Freddy's was an incredibly successful game that launched a powerhouse of a franchise largely thanks to being picked up by a bunch of big YouTubers, but if you're watching this video, you probably don't need me to tell you that. I love the first Five Nights game, even if I physically cannot play it due to anxiety. I think it is legitimately one of the most interesting and well-designed horror games in a very long time. The way it uses the slow and painful build-up to a legitimately terrifying jump scare, the way it weaponizes its ability to create stress and anxiety in the player, it's great. It also ruined horror games for a few years because seemingly everybody saw those YouTube jump scare compilations and thought, oh, I know why that was popular, and skipped over the tension building part. These are, in my opinion, the two best examples of why so many horror games fail to impress. They were looking at the right games, but taking away the wrong lessons. Clock Tower comes from a world where none of those problems had presented themselves yet. There was very little in the games industry that they could pull lessons from, so they instead looked to film and took what they could from there. For the most part, human entertainment was working with a blank slate, and they simply did what they thought would make the best experience. They didn't always nail it? Again, Clock Tower is far from perfect, but considering what they had to work with, it's incredibly impressive in its own right. It's this overall sense of simplicity that I think makes this game worth going back to after 25 years. Playing it now, it almost feels refreshing that the true horror is never revealed to be Jennifer's terrible repressed trauma, but instead just a dude with a big pair of scissors. It's a reminder that sometimes your monster can just be a monster. It doesn't need to be any deeper than that. Despite selling rather well, Clock Tower was never officially released outside of Japan. Even after being rebranded as Clock Tower The First Fear and being ported to the PlayStation, the Wonderswan, and the PC. It was part of the virtual console lineup on both Wii and Wii U, but once again, only in Japan. Kano and Human would go on to develop a sequel for the PlayStation one year later in 1996, simply titled Clock Tower 2. Unlike its predecessor, this one did see a Western release, largely thanks to the overseas success of games like Resident Evil, but here it dropped the number and was simply and confusingly called Clock Tower. This game would see roughly the same amount of success as the first. In 1998, yet another sequel was brought to the PlayStation, Clock Tower 2 The Struggle Within, known as Clock Tower Ghost Head in Japan. This game ignores the other two entries in favor of a new setting and protagonist, and is also the first game in the series to not be directed by Kono. Human had wanted him to produce another sequel to the original story, but Kono had turned down their request as he believed himself to be out of usable material. Unfortunately, upon release, this game was destroyed by critics, sitting at a Metacritic score of 49. Many reviews cited the graphics as being primitive even for the time, with overall lifeless environments and voice acting that removed any fear or tension you might have had. In 2000, Human Entertainment declared bankruptcy and shut its doors for good, with its properties and developers scattering to the winds. 
Clock Tower specifically wound up with Sunsoft, and in 2002 they teamed up with Capcom to develop Clock Tower 3 for the PlayStation 2. This game moved away from the series' usual point-and-click style of gameplay in favor of giving the player direct control of the protagonist, and in terms of plot, it was yet again unrelated to any of the previous entries in the series. It was also notably co-directed by Kinji Fukasaku, a legendary Japanese film director who some Americans might know best as the director of Battle Royale. This game received mixed reviews, though they were generally positive in terms of the game's presentation. Even so, the game seriously fell short of the sales numbers Capcom had hoped for, by 2003 having only sold just over 122,000 units compared to Capcom's projection of 450,000. In 2002, Hifumi Kono helped found a new studio known as Nude Maker, built up mostly of former human entertainment developers. They would team up with Capcom to co-develop 2002's Steel Battalion for the Xbox, and have worked closely as contractors for companies like Platinum and Sega, among others. They are, however, more well-known in Japan as the developer of several adult PC games, which Kono claims is not the reason for their studio name, but I'm not sure anybody believes him. Other ex-human devs would move to studios like Sandlot or Spike, with many of them moving to Suda51's Grasshopper Manufacturer, the studio behind games like Killer7 and No More Heroes. Clock Tower as a franchise has been dormant for almost 20 years, with any semblance of life being given by two games largely considered to be spiritual successors to the series. In 2005, Capcom released Haunting Ground on the PS2. The game is notable for having many similarities in tone to Clock Tower, specifically Clock Tower 3, as well as for a few other things I don't think are worth getting into in this exact moment. The other spiritual successor is much closer in lineage to the original series, the 2016 PC title Nightcry. Nightcry was developed by Nude Maker and in an indirect way was the first Clock Tower game to be helmed by Hifumi Kono since 1996. The game was not received well by critics upon release, with many of them pointing out that it felt dated and was unfortunately riddled with bugs. Most recently, Kono served as the scenario writer for the visual novel Root Film, set to be released sometime in 2020. The original Clock Tower remains in my mind a symbol of a bygone era in the horror genre, and it's really a shame the only way to play it in the West is through a fan translation. If you've got a spare few hours and enjoy a good point-and-click horror experience, as imperfect as it may be, I cannot recommend Clock Tower enough. We may have since gotten several more frightening monsters to run away from than Bobby the Scissorman, but Jennifer's terrifying trek through the Barrow's Mansion will always be close to my heart. Now put Jennifer and the Scissorman in Dead by Daylight. Thank you.